Excuse me. Uh, you also, uh, I apologize in advance. I'm, I'm a little sick, so uh, if I'm hard to understand, please let me know. I'll repeat myself. Um, we're going to start with the planning board. Uh, do we have any? Do we have any planning board business to oh. begin with, or are we just going to go right to the? We, we to could the put bills these and yeah, minutes. we'll go through the, there's one bill, we have a bill, uh, you can explain it. Well, it, it, this is all for uh, WB Mason. Uh, I know Nicole had put this out on Dropbox, but it's office supplies, totaling $135.85. Okay, does everybody want to see it? Or have you seen it on Dropbox? Okay. So I guess I'll call the vote. All in favor of approving? This bill for W. M B. Mason for the total of $135.85. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. And now we, we have two sets of minutes as well. I didn't hear the, the, who made the motion and seconded. Oh, I'll make the motion oh. to approve the bill. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Now let's try this again. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. Take two on sick day. <laughs> we have two sets of minutes. Um, has everybody had a chance to look them over? We have May 14th and April 30th. We'll start with April 30th. Motion to approve as with changes noted. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Any changes, corrections? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, April 30th minutes. Move on to the May 14th minutes. Are there any changes, corrections? Hearing none, uh, the chair will, will hear a motion to approve. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Pass. All right, we have a couple minutes. I think we're close enough to open the public hearing for 60 West Main Street, Cumberland Farms Incorporated. So we have the team from Cumberland Farms in the audience. Okay, you're welcome to come on up. Yeah, absolutely. You're ready. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of Cumberland Farms uh, and its application for a special permit for an automobile filling station uh, and site plan review for a retail convenience store with automobile filling station at 60 West Main Street here in Norton. With me this evening are civil engineers John Marchand and Christian Farland, Maureen Schlebeck, our traffic engineer from McMahon Associates, and Tracy Roll. Uh, the developer from TM Crowley. So maybe a little bit of background before we just jump into the design. Uh, we have met twice with town officials starting last November, uh, planning director, Mr. DiGiuseppe, um, building commissioner, town manager, um, representative from the uh, water department, representative from the fire department. Uh, we had some preliminary plans at that point. Uh, just an informal meeting made some site changes, came back in March with essentially the same group, got some more feedback, uh, and then we had submitted to the planning board for these approvals and also to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Last Wednesday, we received um, variances for the signs to allow the signs as proposed.
proposed. The one change was we had asked for eight seconds to switch between smart pay member to non-smart pay member, and they gave us 10 seconds, which is what the bylaw requires. So um, that was last Wednesday. We've also reached out and had feedback from the superintendent of the public schools and also from the Council on Aging. And so we've also got some peer review comments from a couple of the professionals here tonight for traffic and storm water, and we've also got the planning department comments from Mr. G D Giuseppe. We don't anticipate closing this evening. I think what we'd like to do is make the presentation to you and get your feedback and a better feedback and see how these plans um, may change as a result of that feedback in, in the peer reviews as well. Um, I think we're probably looking at about a month out for the next hearing, so just to keep that in mind, if, if at the end of the meeting we could have a list of our homework, I think that would help uh, quite a bit. So without more, I'll turn it over to John Marchand from um, Fallen Corp to talk about the design. Thank you. Good evening, uh, John Marchand from Fallen Corp. Um, so our site's at 60 West Main Street. It's on the south side of West Main Street, just to the east of the, um, the Yell Elementary School. Um, it's a 1.4 acre site, uh, previously occupied by a Bank of America, um, which has since been demolished. Uh, the bank kind of had uh, two driveway entrances off West Main with a, a loop around, drive through, and then exit. Um, uh, but like I said, that, that building has been demolished. The pavement remains. Um, the site is located entirely within the, the uh, village commercial um, zoning district. Uh, what our proposed development is, is to include a 4,384 square foot Cumberland Farms convenience store um, with uh, six dual sided uh, fuel stations. Uh, so you'd have uh, 12 fueling areas, um, and that would be under a, a canopy and on a, a concrete map. Um, we're proposing 24 uh, 10 by 20 parking spaces located on the north side and the, um, the east side of the, the building and then to the east of the, the fueling area. Uh, we have a, a uh, trash and recycling dumpster area to the north of the, uh, the parking spaces over there, and um, two underground storage tanks also to the, to the south of the fueling islands. Um, storm water from the site is designed to be collected. Um, we have three catch basins throughout the site, two, two of them located near the basin, and then a trench drain located on the eastern site entrance. Um, those are designed to collect the runoff and direct them toward uh, a surface uh, infiltration basin. Roof runoff is, is proposed to be collected and discharged to an underground subsurface chamber system, uh, which eventually discharges to the same surface infiltration basin. Um, as far as site landscaping, We're proposing a variety of, of native shrubs and, and trees to kind of provide a buffer from, from West Main Street and the abutting properties. Uh, we have a, a solid vinyl fence around the perimeter of the property from approximately here to the, to the, to the end of the rear property line. Um, for site lighting, we have a site lighting plan that demonstrates that uh, our site lighting is contained on site um, we don't we don't have any um, foot candle trespass onto the abutting properties um, we have received our, our peer review comments from uh, Chessia consulting and and we feel that uh, we can uh, we can address those with a little bit of work and um, and I think uh, if given the opportunity we'd like to kind of review those comments with mr. Chessia to, to make sure we're um, getting exactly what he's looking for but at this point, I'd be uh, glad to turn it over to Maureen for any traffic. 
I had a question. Um, you said the fencing is just going to, is it just on the, the east side there? Or is it around the, the back as well it's as the south? along the east and all the way back to the, to the front. Okay. Okay. Can I say that marked as six feet high? <clears throat> yes. That's what's proposed. We've um, raised, we, we issued a, a comment on that. Initially thinking eight feet, but talking with the building commissioner, eight feet then requires a permit. It's then considered a structure. So revising it to seven feet, but certainly the board could determine, obviously you could keep six feet if you'd like or whatever building height, but um, there is a residence fairly close, mm -hmm. a couple of residences fairly close. So we wanna give them a little extra protection with the height of the, of the fence. Yeah, and, and so we haven't made any of the changes from any of the peer review or the planning department comments because we wanted to take everybody's comments and then take a look at the plan holistically just so we weren't making piecemeal changes. So we've got it, we're thinking about it, and so just to, so you don't think that we're totally... Um, and, and to the board, I don't want to speed through everything, so if, if there are any questions, please um, please speak up. Okay, you can continue. Oh, thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Maureen Schleback. I'm um, a senior project manager with McMahon Associates at 350 Miles Standish Boulevard in Taunton, Mass. Our company uh, completed the traffic study for this site. And what I'd like to do is give you a brief overview, and then if you have questions, I can go into more detail on any of the aspects. Um, when we do a traffic study, we typically approach it in three steps. First, we assess the existing conditions. Then we project ahead to a future build condition. And lastly, we look at the operations of the proposed site and the surrounding street system. So when we looked at the existing conditions, we went out and inventoried the, the road conditions in the field. Um, we did collect traffic counts in October of 2018 on a Thursday. Uh, first, we collected 7 to 9 a.m. and found the peak period in the morning to be 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. And then we counted from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the peak hour was found to be from 5 to 6 p.m. These counts were not seasonally adjusted. Um, we looked at data nearby in Norton and found that October is higher than average. So to be conservative, we worked with the raw count data. We looked at five years of crash data at four intersections, West Main at Norton High School, West Main at the elementary school driveway, and then West Main at both of the site driveways. <clears throat> and over the five year period, each of these four intersections had seven or less crashes. We related the number of crashes to the volume of traffic at each of those intersections, and we came up with crash rates that were lower than 0 0.3 crashes per million entering vehicles. And to give you a perspective on that, the statewide average for an unsignalized intersection is 0.57. So we were well below the state average. Next, we projected the traffic uh, out seven years to a 2025 condition. Um, we coordinated with the town. There were no roadway projects in the area that would influence this study. Um, there was a site, a specific site to be included, and that's the Blue Star Business Park. So we got the traffic study for that site and superimposed that traffic onto our study area. And we also used a 1% per year growth rate, and that was based on the advice of SERPED. So with that, we were able to get our future no-build traffic. Um, next, we estimated the traffic that would be generated from our site. And to do this, we used information that's published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, we used the land use code of convenience market with gas pumps. And we estimated for each of the peak periods, AM and PM. So in the AM, we found uh, we expect to attract 89 trips into the site and 89 out in the morning. Um, but of these trips, based on the nature of the site, because it's a convenience market and gas station, uh, it often pulls traffic off of the roadway, existing traffic that's already on the roadway, and we call that pass-by traffic. So when we then related how much was passed by and how much was new, what we found in the morning peak, the new trips in and out of the site were 33 entering and 33 exiting. In the PM peak, we have a total of 108 entering, 108 exiting, and of those, 37 trips in each direction are new trips on the roadway. We distributed the trips to the surrounding street network based on the patterns we saw, which essentially wound up being 50, 50% <laughs> on Route 123. Um, and then we looked at 
the, the operations um, of each of the key intersections. So we ran capacity analysis and we came up with delay measurements. Um, levels, we, we estimated levels of service for each movement. Those are ranked from A through F, but typically you, if you're designing, you would design for level service D. That's considered adequate. Um, the traffic on Route 123 stayed at high levels of service. We did find, though, that the site traffic leaving Cumberland Farms um, was exper will experience delays. However, the volume to capacity ratio is less than one, indicating that there is gaps in the traffic on 123 to allow those patrons to get back out into the, into the traffic. Uh, we studied this a little further by looking at um, a gap study on 123 where we actually sit there and we measure with the stopwatch how many times there's a gap in the traffic of sufficient length to allow either a right or left turn. And what we found was there were enough right turn gaps for 266 right turns out of that site and we were projecting between 41 and 49 depending on the peak hour. Um, and the left turn gaps, you need longer for a left turn gap, uh, was 130. In that, uh, in that peak hour. And that was during the PM peak that we looked at this. And what we're projecting for left turns is 48 to 59. So there's plenty of gaps out there to service the traffic that's projected to come to our site. Uh, we also evaluated the site driveways in terms of, of site distance and found both of them to be adequate in both directions. Uh, and so with all the information that we had analyzed, we did conclude that the site would not adversely affect the surrounding street system. Uh, we have looked at the peer review comments that came to us yesterday. And similarly to the stormwater comments, we're, we're pretty um, confident that if, if it's um, amendable to the board, we could work directly with Jeff Burke to do comment, response, comment, response, and talk through a lot of these. Um, and I'm happy to get into any of the comments that he came up with if you'd like to discuss those tonight as well. Steve, may I ask Absolutely. a question? <coughs> Hi, Maureen. Hi, Julie. How are you? Good. Thanks. Did you look at all, and maybe this is a question for all of you, looking at the plan, the driveways don't necessarily line up with a driveway across the street from it. And we have a problem in this community with a lot of offset turning movements. I personally live off a road that has an offset kind of four-way stop. And it makes it very, very difficult <coughs> to get in and out of the businesses in the area. So I would just encourage you guys maybe to look at that a little bit to see if you could potentially tweak the driveway entrances to better line up maybe with some of the surrounding businesses from a traffic standpoint. So you're kind of looking straight across from the person who's potentially, let's say, coming out of uh, Norton House of Pizza or Bagels and Cream uh, because <coughs> I, I worry about the location of the driveway and the number of curb cuts we're going to have on both sides potentially and how people are going to be able to cross over 123 which is busy especially during peak hour to, mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't have an increased number of potential accidents. And if I can just add to that one of the issues I had along with that is it, it's the senior center right across the way. And yeah. one of the comments that the director on, of the Council of Aging had was particularly the, their left turn movements heading west to make sure that we're not creating any additional conflicts with, with that movement. Okay. And a number of them also park in the development next to that because parking is so limited at, at that site. So I would, I would take that for the curb cuts along that area. A lot of them do park in the retail space next to the next to the, the senior, the senior center. center okay council of aging so j just some food for thought just looking at the general layout of the site and coming from the transportation background which yeah. Marie knows so. well, I mean obviously some of that will depend on man the maneuvers internal yes. to our site yeah. and getting I agree with that. I'm also truck, looking yeah. at how the parking's laid out and yep. can you make a turn and I think we all know people come in with trucks and they're going to block a whole row of that parking when the landscaping truck comes in there and they're going to be filling up their gas tanks and there goes one whole strip of parking by your retention basin so I do agree, and I know yeah. that's in the larger thing, but just something I was So we'll look at it relative yeah. to the site layout yep. and see what we so can work out. So just, just food for thought while we're talking about traffic and-, and Okay, you know, thanks, Julie. The curb cuts, so thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you also look into the, uh, the crash counts for um, Taunton Avenue and Mansfield? Um, when they did the Blue Star project, 
they looked at those crash, um, the crash data for those two sites, and they're significant. Also, could you also provide us at some point with the data that you've used? Uh, you said you've looked at the Blue Star data. Could you provide us, identify what data you've used for that purpose? Yeah, that was the traffic study that was submitted to the town for that okay, project. Well, if you have, let me know, I'd like to know what sure. data you've used in determining that because there was significant increases raising in some cases uh, into, a, into a level of service of F. Um, and those, they're problematic as they are right now. Right, Th and that site's a little bit further out from our site, so the, some, well, some of the intersections they looked at are outside of our study area. Well, they're not that far up from where you are, of my understanding. Also, could you also provide a cue as to what the backup is? Yes. In those areas? Yep, and that was one of the comments in the peer review to requested a cue diagram, so we will be preparing those. Okay. Now, uh, your, your traffic count, your, 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 the traffic in, out, uh, in and out of your site, um, you said was 89 uh, and 108. Um, how does that compare with your other sites in the area, like your site at Mansfield and your site, your other site in Norton? So we, we base it on the square foot of the convenience store. Um, when we use the ITE trip generation rates, it's based on the square foot of the convenience store. So if it's a comparable size store, it would be similar traffic volumes in and out. How, how does this store compare to the Mansfield site, for example, the size of this store? Uh, I don't know that offhand. Okay. We could we could look up that. Okay, and I believe you also have a site currently in Norton? There's a Cumberland Farms in Norton. Yeah. Yes, there's a Cumberland Farms. Across so if we can get an idea of the, the traffic volume we have there as opposed to taking a number uh, out of somewhere else. One of the, the other things that I, I just draw your attention to is there is a senior center across the street from that, and there is a significant traffic data as to the limitations and the problems that seniors have, particularly in making left-hand turns. Um, it's particularly dangerous for them as to their response times, and you might be finding gaps in, in, in travel, uh, but making a left-hand turn becomes particularly problematic for senior citizens, and if you're coupled that with traffic coming out of your site as opposed to theirs, um, we increase the risk of uh, problems and injury. So if you could look at that and give us your ana some analysis as to how that factors into what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, is there was a, a great deal of data uh, and a lot of schedules. Um, if there's something, if there's some way you can point to us the specifics that you were using, relying on it for what the numbers were. Um, I'm not sure, there was a couple, you had a couple of different scenarios that looked like they were the same. I was reading through it and it looked like it was the same schedule and I couldn't tell what the differences were. I don't know if you can identify the specific schedules. That you mean in, in terms of like future no your, build report, and build? Yeah. yeah, so we, first we analyze existing conditions and then we project out seven years for no build conditions. So for that, you know, we'd raise the background traffic at 1% a year and we'd add the industrial park that's proposed, we'd add that traffic to it. And then we would call that our no build condition and we would then analyze that. And then the last evaluation is with Cumberland Farms in place and that we were calling that our future build condition. Okay, I understand that, but if you could at some point just identify which of those schedules you used in coming up with the number that you have, the 108, the total. Okay. Yep. Um, the other thing that you mentioned was um, the road conditions. Uh, oh, the pass through, the, pa the pass by pass traffic. Pass by traffic, yes. Now you're you're claiming anybody coming in just to fill up is going to be pass through traffic. So what I'm saying is, is oftentimes you know when we're out and about. We stop to get gas when we're really on our way to another destination. So, we, you know, I'm not really leaving my house, driving to the gas station, driving back home, right? I'm probably driving to work and I'm stopping at Cumberland Farms to fill up my gas tank on the way. So what happens is you turn into the site and then you, you leave again in the same direction. You know, you don't head back the opposite way. I can tell you, I, I go to the Mansfield Station, Cumberland Farms, and it's not a pass-through. I'm going there to get gas. Uh, there are only certain sites in town that I'm aware of uh, that provide gas. And from my own experiences, uh, those tend to be trips, not necessarily, although there's very often on, on my way to some place, but very often because of the need for gas and the limit, limited availability in some places, in Norton, 
I will make a special trip to that. And I'd like to know how you calculate that as opposed to saying sure. all the chips coming in there and all the chips coming out are right. just passed through because I don't believe that's the case. No, so, so the percentages that we used in the morning peak hour, we used 63% was passed by. In the afternoon, I believe it was 67% is passed by passed by and that is based upon data that's collected by the Institute of Transportation Engineers and they collect data nationally for a number of land use codes and as I said that was what was applicable to a convenience store with with gas pumps so it's, it's a accumulation of a lot of data that goes into those numbers now was come on farms has done their own studies and found pass by rates even higher but it, to be conservative in our traffic studies, we do abide by what's published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I, if, if at all, this area of town, from my experience, is particularly problematic in terms of traffic. And, and, and I understand if you're breaking it down, there's only 38 spe people coming in and out. It may not be material. But when you're talking about 189, it may become more material. And I know you use the factors in the published data. Um, but if there's some way of identifying the concerns of this particular site for this particular traffic and making some analysis that goes beyond what you're going to get out of a book for a typical area. And if you find another area that you have a store in that you, that you can use in as an example, that would help. You know, okay. I know Mansfield, I know there's some others that I've, I've looked at that we're aware of, and I don't know how the traffic uh, analysis, I don't think it's, I don't ever see that being backed up on that, in front of that store at all. So I don't know that that could pay, if you use that for that store, maybe fine, but comparing it to one in which I think the queue in many cases will back up beyond where this, where your location is, uh, to use that same standard does not seem to be appropriate. So okay. if there's some way you can give us some other analysis that can give us some comparables to some other place. Right. Maybe and, and we can, we'll work with your peer review engineer to go through. We, we actually had somebody out in the field measuring the queues um, based upon the review comments particularly relative to the high school. So we have, you know, real data in terms of how far that queue extends. Um, it did not extend to the common farms, to the proposed common farms driveway. Uh, so I know you do have that problem, right? Like the 10 to 15 minutes before the high school starts, you have excessive queues in that area and you have queues from the light in the opposite direction. So, so we have we have looked deeper, we've peeled back, and we haven't just done the analysis based upon the computer programs and the books. I, so I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the, the uniqueness thing, of the area. The other thing is the trip analysis. Uh, you talk about it in terms of the square footage of the convenience stores. Is there anything that bases on the number of uh, gas, gas uh, uh, the, the pumps of the, of the gas pumps? Yeah, th there's. Is there a so I mean, you have, uh, right, Mansfield has two. You're looking for 12. Uh, is that oh, correct? you're asking it based upon how many gas stations are in the well, town. It, yeah. You're, tra you're, giving, you're giving us a, a traffic count based on the square footage of the, of the site of the, um, the convenience store. Right. But you've got one, one, one station has two stations and one is asking 12. And you're not, the, uh, what you're saying, you're not taking into account the traffic de that de deals with that many more stations. And unless you're just saying they're all passed through and ignoring any additional cars coming in and out. Um, yeah, they're in the national average, correct? Yes, yep. And there's data, you know, I believe there's data per pump, but there's, but I do not know about data in terms of how many gas stations are in the town. So we, we, we can take a look at that. Your, your, your traffic count is based upon only the square footage of your store, has no relationship to the number of stations that you're providing. So you have one, one, one op they can have two stores with the same square footage. One has two pumps and one has 12 pumps. You're saying it's the same traffic generation for both. Yeah, there's other parameters that we can use based upon the trip generation manual. So we can, we can look at that to address your concern. Okay. Just, to, just to confirm what I thought you heard, you said that you went and you did kind of analysis on the site for peak hours in the morning and the afternoon. You said the queue did not reach the site. Is that the, this, the queue from the high school traffic. What and then... Uh, the, the queue from the center coming back toward the school. I can't speak to that tonight. I, I, we did look at that, but I don't have that information to speak to tonight. We, 
I, I know specifically the high school did not. The elementary school, you have a really good crossing guide up there who, who does more than cross the kids and actually maneuvers all the traffic. So we didn't, we didn't find the elementary school to be a problem in terms of cues. I do know, you know, I, Miles Standish is really close to here. And to go home in Foxborough, I go through this area all the time. My daughter works at CVS. <laughs> so I, like, I know this area really well. So I know the cues that you're talking about from that light. And um, as I said, we had someone out there this morning. But I haven't had the time to go through all the details of, you know, we started cue diagrams. It didn't all get finished. We just got the comments last night. So you know, I, I, again, if we could, I, I, would, I would like the opportunity to work with your peer reviewer to address these, these issues. I know I've been stuck in that queue when it goes all the way back to home plate, so it's not a, yeah. not a quick moving oh, queue. In that coming thing. into the town center. Coming into center, the right? center yeah. from mm -hmm. Attleboro towards Mansfield. Well, it's usually getting into the high school yeah. where the traffic is, but, so not, mm -hmm. not up past. But yeah, it's, uh, and I think you mentioned that you, there weren't any road construction projects that would affect the traffic. Is that based on capacity of the roadways or just projects? No, no we always, we usually reach out to the town to say, do you have any, and we check MassDOT's site as well. Are there any planned roadway um, projects in the area, <coughs> excuse me, that would change travel patterns or affect our study area? Okay. But it, it doesn't account for projects that would just make a mess of things for a period of time and not alter the traffic. You mean like a construction zone situation? Like, like our sewer project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. helped change the capacity. It's not right. going to change the lane configuration. Right. But it It'll is going to create. Right. Lots of stress. Yes. Yeah. No. Well, we were we were actually projecting out to like a future build, so we did not account for an interim construction project. Okay. If I could. Um, as you know, this is in um, what's called a, a village of commercial zone, and, and one can argue with how successful we've been in trying to promote that concept. But the idea is to, in the village commercial, uh, in exchange for density, which you don't need anyways because you're well below the density requirements. But in, in any event, the intent is to build, bring, uh, to bring building facades closer to the street and, and create more of a downtown look. This is going to be a cornerstone building, I assume, just based on the, the architectural renderings that it's like the one in Attleboro that was just redone, uh, probably not quite as large. Um, but for a couple of reasons, um, one being the village commercial concept, uh, I, for one, would very much want to see the building brought up as close to the street as possible. Um, and by doing that, I I'd hope that we could mutually accomplish a couple of things. Um, one, I think it'll give you uh, some visibility, but what is really of concern and what is one of the goals of a village commercial um, district is create, to create walking traffic. You've got Wheaton College, which is going to be one of your primary customers, kids walking up. Um, and as it's drawn, they're going to have to walk through a parking lot of cars coming and going. Whereas if you were to bring the building up and create an entrance, kind of a uh, a portico entrance on the well on the street side so that people can walk directly in without crossing any traffic and move the the uh, driveway cut uh, closer to the other uh, because you're also gonna have the, the the problem which I don't see a fix for of you know, high school kids after school and sports and grabbing some drinks um, they're going to be walking through all that traffic. If they could just walk through that one cut and then walk uh, to a building that's closer, I think it, you know, A, benefits you. It creates, uh, B, a, a, a better visual image for, for downtown. And C, I think, is, is a little safer. Um, I don't see a, a, a drawback f for you other than having to rearrange the inside because you have now a second. Uh, entryway um, but and then move some of that parking the parking could you'd have more spots on that I got my directions uh, on that westerly side and perhaps put employee traffic up employee parking on the other side of the, the building um, but I, I think it's it's crucial um, to what we're trying to, to develop in terms of that district 
to have the building brought up towards the front, of the front and, and create a facade on that side so it doesn't look like you're looking at the side of a building, but you're looking at taking that entryway and duplicating that on the side. Um, that to me would go a long way in, in uh, satisfying some of my concerns and I, I think it would add to the aesthetic of the downtown. So to add to Joe's point, which I wholeheartedly agree, and, and just, I did this for the project at, at LG North, I need to just disclose, I have a child who goes to the Yale school, so just so you know, I have fourth grader, he'll be there next year for fifth grader. I did the same thing when we had another project next to the school just so that there's no perceived conflict of interest. So just to put that out there, I should have said that before I questioned Maureen, so I apologize for my delay in that. But to follow up on what Joe was saying, I would encourage you guys to also look at where the, the placement of those tables are, Joe, that look like they're on kind of the far side of the building where they have the tables and the umbrellas. That might be something that, one, I would probably encourage you to take a look at maybe increasing. I think there's only two. If you're talking about we in and the high schoolers and potentially other people walking on site, I think you could look at potentially adding more to that and maybe making that, to Joe's point, some type of kind of cafe entrance off the street might be something to... Not that, you know, I don't know if you can do this, but flip the whole building, so to speak. So that's on the, the frontage side. So, food for thought. I could just uh, talk a little bit about um, why the site's laid out the way it is. Um, we did look at trying to trying to move the, uh, the building as close to the street as possible with, with, the, um, with the layout we have here. Um, and the reason that it, the building is where it is is to allow for the... Um, the tanking, the fuel tanker to maneuver through the site and, and exit um, through the driveway without um, crossing onto any parking spaces. Um, so that's that's the I'm reason. Not sure how that works? Um, I assume he goes in the right, or you know, he or she goes right, in yes, the right they side, would, they would come comes around. around. Why couldn't he just if that? And I'm just picking up if the the other cut was at the midpoint of that island, just roughly. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't the tanker wrap around the canopy uh, and you know go in on the right side and come through the middle of that uh, that island where the new cut would be? Um, I think uh, Cumberland Farms tries to maximize the number of parking spaces that they can get. So this this layout gives us the maximum number of parking spaces while also well, if you flip, but if you pull the building up, um, you know you're going to have three or four employees. <laughs> at any one time, uh, three or four parking spaces, put the flip parking on the back, the, the, cut, the, uh, the uh, employees can park on the back, which, which was where they should be anyway, um, and uh, you're not losing parking spaces. In fact, you're perhaps even picking up one or two because now the building is closer and you've got additional potential for parking along the front. Good evening. For the record, Christian Fallon, Principal Engineer and President of Fallon Corp. Um, it's something we can definitely look into, but I just wanted to go over a few of the other issues that I'm just noticing. The, uh, the setback issues as we slide this building up, you see how it's parallel with this property line right now. So I know your intention is to probably have it parallel with the building. I mean, it could, uh, ideally, ideally, but it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, the more we slide it up, I mean, ideally, you would want to start to turn this. And by doing that, obviously, we would, we would lose this. Well, my, my argument is to move that anyway yep. uh, closer to the middle of the island. Closer to have, right. it, come, have yeah. it come straight out more, more aligned with this. That's something we'll have to look at with, with, to work with traffic as well to make sure that would, that would make the most sense, public safety issue. Um, so it is something we can look at. Because you'll agree with me, if I'm walking from Wheaton, the only way to get in that building is to cross all types of traffic, whereas if the no. building is closer and the island's moved over, traffic's not an issue for me. Yeah, I think either way we need to look at getting public uh, oh, no pedestrian, pedestrian crosswalk to the, to the building itself. That's something we'll do either way or whether we could figure out a way to get this building there, but I totally agree with you um, being familiar with the meeting foot traffic as well. So it is something we can look into. Um, it's going to be a little more difficult than I think everybody can I have faith. Visualize. But we'll, we'll definitely take a look at it for you. Um, two, two other, what governs the number of gas pumps you have at a site? Um, there's no, nothing that governs it. It's more of um, what, 
what Cumberland feels is, is needed in the area. Um, and this allows for traffic having versus if we only had two pumps, it would create more traffic queues on site rather than having um, the six pumps that we have here, which helps with traffic flow in and out of the site. Uh, Cumberland's big brand that they're, they're pushing is it's convenient to be able to get onto a site to easily maneuver throughout the site um, in a safe manner, be able to exit as well. So we feel the need, there is a need, there's studies that they do throughout every site. And um, well, you, you only have four in Mansfield. You only have, I think you just converted uh, Sharon uh, was, was uh, I think four, you just, I think expanded it to two, two islands, so now there's eight. A uh, place like Chatham has three lanes for six positions. I'm just suggesting, especially if you're concerned with parking and, and access, I don't know why we can't reduce, uh, you know, if it's not governed by a specific count, I don't know if the, if the count, again, is based upon, the traffic count is based on the square footage of the store, I don't know where, where the, the islands and the gas pumps um, have a bearing on that. I don't know, I don't know your industry, so I'm not sure how Yeah, I think, I mean, you make a good point that, you I mean, you drive all the way to Mansfield just to get gas, so there's definitely a need for it in this area when the traffic there certainly seems to be a traffic um, concerns as well. So having the more pumps is something you would rather see than only limiting it to, to not, four. Not necessarily. <laughs> but the other question I had is, in, in your drawing, and I did, I'm, I'm assuming when I saw the front elevation, uh, the windows looked like they were just for show, but in the back elevation, you had a, it looks like a porch. Is there a second floor here? There is a, that, that um, I can turn to the architectural. The back, no, the back. Back area, yeah. This this area here, they hide. They basically hide mechanical equipment. Well, no, there's a door. If you look at the back elevation, mechanical equipment showroom. Is there a stairway? Is it? How do you get access to that? Is that? There you go. It's just for mechanical equipment only. So, is is there a floor that you get access to it from, or is there an attic, or? Have no internal stairs. No, there's no internal stairs. Huh. Uh, you'll know on the back of the building there's kind of a bump out in the sidewalk. That would be to accommodate a ladder to get up to the um, to the mechanicals. Well, that's just in lieu of having it on the roof. Is that it? So it's just a okay. Yeah, th there's no second floor. Okay. Um, you, you talked about having a, a, a is it seven foot fence around the the, the perimeter? We have proposed a, proposed a six foot fence, which is which is standard industry. Um, we would like a chance to meet with the abutters. What we have done in the past, which have some of most abutters have liked, is we we propose a six foot fence and then. Actually, on their, on their side of the property, we can propose some landscaping, which would buffer that fence. Uh, I'm just looking at your note um, on, on this plan, uh, GF, uh, CFG04, and it said, uh, where commercial properties um, adjoin residential properties, regardless of the district, a buffer of 20 feet shall be reserved and screened, uh, screening adequate for the situation, uh, and no characteristics of the use shall be provided in the form of thick planting walls or earthen ber uh, berms to be at least four feet high or higher if preserved i mean is that is that in addition to lands is that in addition to the fencing is there some 20 feet of vegetation that you're going to be putting around those fences basically what you see on the plan here this is the edge of the uh, the concrete so we have the we have the stockade fence is that we 20 feet there 20 feet from distance between here and here no <clears throat> And one inch is equal to 20, so I mean, give me a rough idea. And what about on the left hand side as we're facing it? Over here? Yeah. I'll have to check the exact dimensions, but it looks pretty close to an inch. And again, we have the same 
stockade fence here. Okay. And then um, I, I just said I couldn't figure out the item that's blue in the center. What, what is that reflecting? So this blue area here, this is a Coltec recharge system. This captures the, the roof from the building, which is the orange and the, and the canopy here. So the rooftop area, which is known as clean water, basically re recharges into this system here, which is below the parking lot. Okay. And infiltrates into the ground. And then uh, with regard to your tanks for the gas, um, is there some engineering, is that part of our peer review? Do we have some, some, some way of understanding what that is and being comfortable and verifying how that's being yeah, done? Yeah, so the tanks, the tanks um, follow state regulations and the, and the fire chief. They, that's who it gets permitted through, the state requirements that they have to be met. These are all double walled tanks. They've, knock on wood, have never had a leak through a double wall tank. If the first tank ever leaked, um, there's alarm systems that would go off and there's containment inside that double wall tank, so right away there would be. Hey, hey, could you provide us at some point with the cost of removing those tanks if you were to no longer be on the site? Sure, we can look at that. The area to the right of the concrete pad, that's drainage or is that? The area to the right, this blue area here. Is that, is that intended to be filled or just is that just drainage? That's a drainage for basically the pavement, the pavement area. Uh, the stormwater gets captured through catch, standard catch basins with four foot sumps. Then it goes to a, a drain manhole, which leads to a, a water quality um, inlet, which eventually leads to the, to the basin there. And that basin is basically um, designed to handle a 100 year storm event. And that's how we basically minimize the impacts to the ab abutters. Um, the goal as the engineer is to, for the pre-development, make sure that the runoff from the pre, the post is going to be less than what it is for the pre. And in this case, we've significantly reduced that runoff. I think I should go in abutters. a different direction than you were. Sure. Um, based on stormwater and calculations like that, how frequently do you think that would be filled and to what level in terms of the fact that it's right near a school with eight and nine year olds? Sure. Okay. So stormwater requirements um, statewide are required for that basis. We design it so it drains within 72 hours. Um, so I know it is, I'm not sure the exact amount, but I can get that how many hours it, it, it will drain by. Um, and then this, this basin itself is Roughly um, three and a half feet um, deep. So we could take a look at you know what storm event, what elevation will be at for each storm. It will vary versus a two-year storm, ten-year, twenty-five and a hundred-year storm. Yeah, um, I would like to think that kids will stay away from that, but I know better. Sure. Is, is that stone or, or um, grass? That's grass. In, 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 oh, sorry. in your proposal, you reference that this is in a, um, a water uh, protection district, a, a WRPD 23. In the description, you say you're not in the zone one or zone two. What's the uh, R, that R, WRPD 23? It's actually in the zone three. I think there's a typo. I saw that too. It, but this is a zone three. Well, okay, the question I have is, in looking at our bylaw, it looks, I couldn't see, it looked. It appears to me that a zone three is still dealt with under the Water Protection District, and a gas station is prohibited in that district. So I, I'm, I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm missing something, or I'm, I'm just not sure where that, where that falls. I know uh, I, the maps show a zone one and zone two, but our zoning bylaw has a zone three. And when I was looking at the water resource district, it just says anything in a water re resource district is governed by that and it prohibits a gas station. I'm not sure if I'm missing something or. So that's something that we had addressed with the town back in November and um, we were told that in this location, we have no problem. Well, who, who told you that? Um, all the folks at that initial meeting, so town manager, building commissioner, uh, director of the water, superintendent of the water department. 
conservation there? I don't know that they were there, but I would imagine they knew about it. Uh, okay. I, I, if, if it's in our bylaw, I don't know that anybody can tell you that it doesn't apply. I, I, I'm, and again, I'm not saying it does or it doesn't. That's the way I read it. And if it is in the water re, uh, resource district, um, there is an issue as to whether or not a gas station can go in it. And I don't know how that applies. Well, we can look confirm if it's in zone zone three yeah I was looking at the map and it's not clear it looked to me like it probably was um, but I couldn't tell it's yeah. not that clear it's, like, so. it's possible zone three is the in, the rest of the the entire town so it, no, but no, you're no, right no. It, it does say zone three this was to the it's it ends to the right of the Freeman Street it is to the right of Freeman Street but it was it looks like it ran as far as the circle around the elementary school. It ran to that point, which would be this, this site. Again, I, if we could verify that. Okay. All right, do we have any more questions from the board? We have the peer reviewers here as well. No? Okay. <clears throat> um, how do we want to handle this? We can have the peer reviewers come up and, and go over there their initial reviews. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the record, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm a traffic engineer with the NASA Associates. On behalf of the project team, or the town, thank you for having us tonight. Um, I think if it makes sense, what I'll do is just walk through the comments individually one by one, um, and then if there's any questions, we can certainly follow up. Um, but as far as traffic goes, um, the study was generally done um, in accordance with industry guidelines. It was done um, in a professional manner. We did have a number of comments relative to specifics. Um, comment one, typically a traffic study will include a statement indicating that it was done by a professional engineer and indicate who that engineer is. Um, we're simply asking that a letter be provided that indicates that that was done. Um, under the direction of a, of a PE, so that's pretty easy. Um, second, we asked that the applicant um, evaluate uh, the applicability of MEPA to this project. Um, <coughs> for those that aren't that familiar with it, MEPA, it's the uh, Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, and when a project um, hits certain thresholds, you're required to file either an ENF or an EAR with the state. Um, in this, in this particular instance, the threshold that you would be hitting is, is a traffic threshold, how many trips per day. Um, when you have a site that hasn't been utilized in two years, it's basically considered a vacant site. So if this project generates more than 2,000 trips per day, and when they look at, MEPA looks at it, they really don't care if it's a new trip or a pass-by trip, it's just driveway trips. So it doesn't matter if it's new or pass-by. But if you have more than 2,000, you're required to do an ENF. If you have more than 3,000, you're required to do an EIR. Um, the study doesn't provide a, a projection of the daily traffic, but the, just so the board is aware, um, given the need to get a highway access permit and given the need that the site was, has been vacant for more than two years, um, those thresholds should be evaluated and the town should be informed as to whether MEPA review is required. Um, we had a concern relative to the hours that were looked at for the analysis. Um, certainly the morning analysis and PM analysis are, are appropriate time periods to look at, um, but in the morning, um, the hours that were looked at were 7.30 to 8.30 which while for the quarter may be the peak hour, um, for the school system, it's, it's not the peak hour. So for instance, when, when the analysis was done in the morning, um, from 7.30 to 8.30, there were about 135 lefts into the high school driveway. But that one 15 minute period from 7.15 to 7.30 that just falls out of their analysis, there were 111 lefts into the driveway alone. So the, the, the real busiest hour in the morning, the real key hour is that 7 to 8 when everyone's coming to school, not the 7.30 to 8.30 when much of that traffic's already been processed. So we recommend that they look at 7, 7 o'clock to 8 as that's really the critical time period. Um, commercial developments typically include an analysis of Saturday conditions. Uh, we do recognize that the volumes with the school system will be much lower, but the volumes of, of the site are typically at least as high, if not higher, than what you see on an evening. So we requested a Saturday analysis um, consistent with what you would typically see for a commercial project. Um, typically, studies include a description of um, not just the automobile characteristics, but public transportation, pedestrian and bicycle accommodations that exist. We just ask them to basically provide a more robust description of the, the, the full transportation system that serves the site, not just the vehicular traffic. 
Um, there was a comment in the projection model relative to bus rerouting. There wasn't a real description. They, they moved some of the bus traffic around, it looks like. Just wanted some clarification as to what that um, was for. Um, the trip generation um, generally was done appropriately. Um, we have no, no issue with the, the application of pass-by trips. Many of the trips these projects generate are pass-by in nature. But the land use code that was utilized, um, convenience store with gas station, is, is no longer the appropriate land use code. Uh, the current ITE manual actually has a new land use code 960 called Super Convenient Market Gas Station, which is intended for uh, these newer, larger facilities where the, the store is greater than 3,000 square feet and you have 10 or more pumps. And they, they basically have different trip generation characteristics because you have a lot more items for sale, you have food products, you have uh, you know, a whole host of things you wouldn't tip find your smaller, typical 1,000 square foot variety store that's adjacent to a gas station. So we've requested that the, the, the trip generation be done with the appropriate new land use code 960 and that the pass-by data be um, reviewed. It looked to see if there were some discrepancies in the volumes. Um, again, in terms of the operations, it was done correctly, but we'd like to have the morning peak hour of the schools looked at. That's 7 to 8. Um, want to look at the, the pass-by trips again. Um, vehicle queues, I, I, I know it's come up. I mean, that, that's really the issue here is, you know, when you look at these intersections in a vacuum, you know, that you get a certain story. But if the queue from the high school driveway is, is blocking the driveways, then obviously it doesn't operate as well as it would if that intersection was, was in space by itself. So we've requested a full queue analysis where the queues are actually uh, illustrated uh, on a plan to show how far they extend. Um, in, the, in the morning, I know that there is a crossing guard that stops traffic on 123 at the elementary school when buses are leaving, and that can cause queuing that goes back. So we've asked that the model be calibrated to reflect that the fact that there will be times you want to get in and out of these driveways and there may be a queue that blocks it that, so that the egress won't be as, as efficient as the analysis suggests. Um, minor things in terms of peak hour factors, just some of the inputs to the model we request to be reviewed. Um, pending the results of the analysis, we've asked that um, it be evaluated whether a center um, left turn lane, a dual left turn lane is warranted in this location to facilitate some of these turning movements. There, as some of the board members point out, there are a large number of, of driveways all in close proximity, which creates a number of movements in and out of 123. Um, a center turn lane might be a, a measure that could help at least store those vehicles that are making the turns so that through traffic on 123 eastbound, westbound isn't impeded. Um, we've asked for some, some commitments to TDM programs. Um, not minor things, bike parking, things of that nature, um, direct paychecks. Most, most employers offer, offer these things. Um, with respect to the site plan, we've asked for some auto turn analyses. I know that they described how the trucks work. There's a, there's a simulation model that can actually draw those paths on the plan so we can see how they work and make sure there's no conflicts between the pump, the canopy, parking spaces, and, and trucks, both um, fuel trucks, um, regular delivery trucks for materials at the, at the building, and then most importantly, the largest um, fire apparatus that the town has. Um, just adding some notes about signs uh, being uh, meeting MET city guidelines. Um, notes should be added about site triangles, making sure there's no snow plowed near the driveways, there's no signs, there's no landscaping that will impede sight lines leaving and coming. Um, information relative to loading deliveries and how that will work. We've asked that they look at providing, as, as I already noted, a pedestrian connection between 123 and the site, either through um, a new opening for the island or a painted crosswalk, but, but something that delineates a, a dedicated pedestrian path to and from the store, and then bicycle parking provided as well. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think the study was definitely done in accordance with all, you know, industry guidelines, but there are some areas that we think the analysis could be fine-tuned, um, particularly with regard to that morning 7 to 8 hour when the schools are all traffic is arriving. Yeah, absolutely. Right, one comment on that. Sure. So the shared drive for the high school is also for the Yale school. The Yale school starts at 825. Right. That driveway is the only driveway for parents who are dropping off their children. This back driveway is only for buses only. Right. So I would encourage you to do 7 to 830 to accommodate anybody who's coming to the Yale as a, as a parent right. drop off. The way, the way these analyses work in this industry is, is you evaluate one hour. All right. Then it's I'll stay till 9 if that's the case. We should do 7 to 9. Because that, that driveway is for two different schools. Right. What I'm saying is they could do a 7 to 8 analysis and an 8 to 9 analysis, but yep. you, you can't That's do fine. a 7 to 9 analysis. That's seven, okay. 7 15 to 8 15. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, to Julie's the, point, too, earlier, Yell. Uh, yeah. I also have a child at the Yale, and I, and I should have mentioned that as well. Um, and we do drop her off through that driveway there, so. Um, 
and it's usually around 710. So yeah, I would say seven to eight and then eight to nine. Yeah. yeah. I know the Blue Star st survey was seven to nine. I mean, they had the hour, the breakdown of the hours, but I'd like to see the survey go through nine o'clock, through nine o'clock. Yep, seven sure. To nine. No, they, they, they should be an ability to do a, a seven to eight peak, which is the peak of the school. Yeah. And then the road, it appears at 730 to 830, but I mean, if it was eight to nine, it, you'd evaluate the entire two hour period. But the important thing is just, if you, if you start the, the analysis at 730, you miss the hundreds of cars yeah. that are arriving I between seven and 730. Wholeheartedly okay. agree with that, yes. Could, could yeah. I just ask uh, on the, the MEPA thresholds? Sure. Is it 2,000? trips per day per day that's right so if you had a if you had a site that that's a virgin site which is what this would be considered because nothing's been there for two years you, you look at the total trips per day and it's is it's that one way or, or both ways so if you're if you're a customer going there you count as two trips no, no, one I'm in, talking one about out. the traffic on West Main Street in front of that site right we're talking 2,000 trips combined east and west just into the these site. these are just into the site roads. just into driveway the counts right so if you look at if, I guess an easy way to look at it is if you're saying your peak hour trips are over 200 then you're you're putting your open you're probably going to hit 2,000 daily trips I, I would I strongly suspect this project will meet at at, at least an ENF threshold good catch Julie and again if it's 3,000 it would be a, an environmental impact report I have until 8.25 to get him to the front door of the yell. Not that I do that, but just saying. 8.24. <laughs> 7.24. <laughs> All right. Um, any further questions from the board for? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we have one more. Hey, Dylan, uh, John Chessie with uh, Chessie Consulting Services. So I look pretty much just ex strictly at the stormwater aspects of it, and um, it's under the it's submitted under the town's bylaw, and the bylaw basically mimics the um, DEP stormwater management standards with a couple of caveats, which I will sort of touch base on. And I'm just sort of just going to go through the things, the standards, and sort of the things that I think they need to look at under those standards. So standard one requires that you do not create a point source discharge that results in erosion, sedimentation, and that you have all discharges treated. The site basically creates a discharge here. They have like somewhat of a level spread, but in my opinion, you know, you're taking all the water from the site and you're dumping it to one person at one spot, regardless whether it's spread out over five or ten feet. It's not a control right now. There's no runoff coming off the it's of any concentrated nature if you go to the site. So they would probably need an easement for that because they have flow coming out of it most storms, except for probably the smallest one. <coughs> Next one, standard two, you're required to control peak rates of runoff. There's a bunch of the assumptions that were made uh, that I think are not consistent with site conditions. So what we do when we do that is uh, online you look in this maps that have been developed by the Natural Resource Conservation Service and they've sort of mapped soils which is a start. So you look and see what the soils are mapped like and in this case there's essentially a line about through here it says this side is one type of soil and this side is another type of soil, both of which aren't very good. The back side's listed, I believe, as a D, which D soils are typically wetlands, actually. They're almost impermeable ledge or they, they don't absorb any water. And the front is a C, which is a little better. But the on-site test pits, and there were several done, um, they show up here. They've got, that's one there, one there, one there. They had another one in here. And there's another one, I think, somewhere else. I don't see it on this case. But the test pits, if you go out to the site, plus there's an excavation where the building was. The test pits were inconsistent with what the mapping by the government was, because mapping by the government, they might dig a hole every five acres, two acres. And then they read topographic maps to develop what they think the soils are going to be. In this case, the soils are actually much better, which is good for an infiltration base in, an, in subsurface system, but they overestimated how much water comes off the site in the existing case. <laughs> so they need to back up the cover condition, the, so the, the uh, soil condition looks like it's more of a B than a C or a D, and under the, um, the, and as you go deeper, you get better soils, but the restrictive B layer would be the 
the governing one. Um, and the other thing is they said the whole site's a poor brush condition, and that's not the case either. It was grass. It was a lawn for the bank. It's grown in. It's heavily vegetated, with one exception, and that's the hole where the bank used to be. That would be probably a poor cover condition because you can just see bare dirt. There's no topsoil. Nothing's really growing. Um, so that sort of affects the whole sort of basis of what was done. Yeah, the way it works, so the roof goes to this. As was stated, there's a trench drain here, which I would like to see some more detail. And trench drains are notorious for not actually catching everything because they, they get plugged easy. Sometimes they're narrow. There's no real detail exactly what that is, how wide it is. But this would then come down, go to this, go into the basin. There's a couple catch basins here. The 100 year elevation in this is higher than the rim on this. So in fact, it wouldn't even get caught in the bigger storms and go by. And that needs to be addressed. They also modeled every pipe which isn't really what the software program is supposed to do. It's a different type of model. So that, I think, needs to be dealt with. Um, there's <coughs> there is some groundwater, I guess, was, was spotted or evidence of signs of where the water table would be seasonally. And they are, in one case, I think, 3.2 feet from it. Another one is less. But um, the plants and the calcs weren't really consistent on that, some of the evidence. They need to kind of clarify that. But if you're going to use infiltration in bigger storms, you have to have either greater separation or a, a mounding analysis to make sure that the groundwater doesn't impact the capacity of the basin. Um, there's a whole a bunch of issues with some of the design and details. We look at a DEP manual. It'll say, this is what a basin should look like. It should have a low level drain, it should have a monitoring well, it should have all these features and those are things that need to be added to the um, design. The next standard would be recharge which actually because of the size of this and this they would likely meet the recharge because whatever they hold soaks into the ground as long as it meets the number you're okay and it's not a hard number to typically meet. I still think the calcs need to be adjusted but it should be easily met for a site with this type of a design. Standard four is water quality. This is a gas station, so it also hits on the next standard, which is standard five. It's a land use with higher potential pollution load. <laughs> so with those two factors, you need a pretty robust treatment system so you don't get a gas spill and it doesn't get into the ground, especially where you're infiltrating the water. Um, and I don't believe they are uh, in compliance with that. Trench drain doesn't provide any treatment. The catch basins catch too much area to get credit from DEP, so they have one proprietary system and that's it. Um, and that, I think, is overestimated as to what it'll give you. So uh, typically, you've got to look at some other design for that. I think that uh, the American Petroleum Institute has guidelines on oil water separators for these types of sites as well to protect <laughs> if there's a gas spill. More you know, there's a little bit of drips. They get caught in the concrete and evaporate for the most part. It's more like if you have something go wrong when they fill in the tanks or something like that, that would be the big problem. Um, so I think they need to look into that. <coughs> the other next standard is a redevelopment standard, standard six. There is pavement out there, but none of it's being reused. So the only credit they kind of get out of that is sort of recharge. They have some pavement already there, so they only have to meet what's new. Um, Actually, standard, I'm sorry, standard six is a critical area. It's not a critical area. Standard seven is um, recharge. The other thing that they'll need to do, and I kind of recommend you get it before um, the hearing's closed, is the construction plan, stormwater pollution prevention plan and all that. I mean, this is a pretty densely <coughs> developed site. There's, um, the soils are pretty good, but where's the water go during construction? Does dirt get tracked into the road? This is a busy road next to all the schools. How is it phased? Where do stockpiles go? All of those things should be shown in the plan, construction trailers, all that information. And the last one is standard nine, which is the O&M plan. And that's, um, that was pretty good, but some of the stuff was missing and in the report that said was in the report, but I couldn't find it. And one thing didn't seem likely to be able to be done because the subsurface system really doesn't have any access. Granted, it doesn't get much dirt because it's roof runoff, so you get a little, little bit of stuff off the roof, but not the same as sanding or salting. Um, but you can't, I don't see how you're going to clean it, clean it with a clamshell as was listed in the report. 
So under your bylaw, the couple of things that are slightly different that are triggered is if you, if you don't recharge an inch of runoff, you have to go into a phosphorus calculation. They would recharge the inch, so they wouldn't have to do that. And there's also a lot of information in the bylaw on the um, construction phase plans and whatnot. But that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I, I'm certainly no uh, groundwater expert, um, but a couple of things that you said concern me, and that is the overflow of that drainage area um, flowing on to, uh, potentially flowing on to uh, adjacent property, which is an issue, I think, for anyone. Right. Um, is that corrected by introducing more infiltration system? If you infiltrate so that you don't have any outflow in a 100-year storm, you would not have an issue. Um, it's, I mean, they have outflow in more, in more frequent storms than the 100-year storm. So um, the yeah, 100-year storms are fairly, theoretically at least, it's a fairly rare event. It's a 1% chance of happening in a year. It doesn't mean that it won't. But when you're discharging directly onto an abutting property like that, I, I would say you need to get an easement to do that or permission of some, you know, some nature. Uh, if it were my property, I don't think I would want that to be directed at me, nor probably would any of the <laughs> applicants' <laughs> representatives either. Could that be addressed with more infiltration on the site? I bl it, it probably could be. There's, I mean, from what I get, saw out there and what the test, the logs report is that you have what's called, there's either fill or topsoil, then there's what's called loamy sand, which is a reasonably permeable material. It's not, there's, a, there's some fines in it, but not a lot. And below that is like sand, coarse sand. And if you go out there and you look, you can see where they dug the holes. And, you know, I've seen a lot of holes dug over the years. And if, after a hole's been left, if the soils are poor, you would s see this like almost packs, smears of the dense material. Plus, the foundation is a hole. And if it was that bad, that as the, um, NRCS reported, there'd probably be water in that hole because the desoil doesn't drain for days when it rains, and we've had plenty. And there's no water in the hole when I was out there. And, you know, that was a, a few, several weeks ago. When it's <laughs> we've had but a handful of dry days <laughs> over the last uh, few, but prior to that, it was raining almost every day. Do we have any further questions? No, I think the applicant already expressed they're looking forward to talking <coughs> with you about kind of what you saw. So I think I'd look look to that. Yeah, but before we take any um, comments or questions from from the abutters, um, that's what I was going to point out that they they haven't met yet to to go over their findings and um, I believe both parties have requested at least a four week extension to um, so. I believe that the date of the closest meeting would be the 16th of July, um, but we can do that when we continue it later. Uh, I just wanted to make a note of that before we had the abutters come up and speak. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you. It was, uh, it was raised in, in someone's review, but uh, hours of operation, 24? Right. Um, can you do anything other than 24 hours? I believe you have. Um, um, in Sharon, you go from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Nantucket, you go from 5 a.m. to 12 a.m. I mean, could we limit some hours? You, you are abutting residential areas. Understood, but I think um, Cumberland Farms, based on this site, would like to stay with 24 hours. I think we can be amenable to neighbors as far as uh, turning off any of the audio equipment at the pumps. There are certain audio that has to occur based on state regulation where somebody inside the building can speak to somebody outside of the building, but any of those audio advertisements for music we can limit between the hours of you know, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. or 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. or something like that. Um, and then also I think what we can do is look to restrict 
um, trash pickup to a, a, some time that makes sense. And do you have any any surveys that indicate how much business you do during the hours from two to twelve a.m.? I don't to know that that necessarily matters. The number of business, the, the the amount of business that happens between let's say midnight and five a.m. I think. Carmel and Farms as a company wants to have a 24 hour presence so that people don't need to think about is it open or is it not open? They can just know that it's gonna be open and go there. But you don't have that at all locations? We don't have that at all locations. We would like it at all locations. I'm sure. <laughs> Does the site have an air compressor station? It's a good question. It's open. That's it's a very good question. Yeah, that's something we can definitely okay. shut down. It's also important to note that the lighting, um, the, as 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 it as it gets dark, the actually light starts to, to dim. Okay. Um, can I actually get a show of hands from the audience? Anybody who'd like to come up and speak? Okay, so we have a couple. Um, I'm thinking if it's easier if, if, if you gentlemen sit and then they they ask Thanks. questions. I'm sorry, you, you should have sat earlier. Um, we can get to any of butters, and if there are any questions, we'll we'll have you come up afterwards after they spoke. No problem. Thanks a lot. I just into the microphone. Just sure. your name and address. My name is Sue Lieber, and I live at 16 Seminary Way. I am. One of the main abutters, my land actually abuts the entire property, back of the property. Um, so you're the one all the way straight across the back of the fence line? I am. I, I basically, my property line goes from here to here. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Um, I have a few concerns um, with where the gas tanks are, and I don't know any of the laws or the regulations for that. But that looks on the plan like it's 17 feet from the property line, and I could be wrong, and I don't know if somebody wants to correct, um, from, from here to here. And my house is probably another 50 feet from those tanks. So that's a concern of us. Um, we actually have a swing set that's pretty, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet from the property of where those tanks would be. Um, and that the fencing is a big concern. Um, it doesn't look like it goes all the way to the edge of the property. Um, and six or seven feet, I really don't feel is enough. Um, I know in the past, when this property was up before, they had approved a 13-foot soundproof fence. Um, I don't know what the rules are for that, but that's something that we'd like to have considered. Um, and the runoff is a very big concern. Because while my property line does go to the edge, there is a house that's right, that abuts my property line that's right there. And it just, you can't see it on this plan, but there is a house there. And I don't know if you guys have ever been over to the property or been on Seminary Way where the circle is, but it is much closer than it appears based off the drawing. So if you do have the opportunity, it would be great if you could just take the ride by. Have you have you met with them? Have, have you all met yet? Um, I did meet um, the gentleman. I can, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Tom, um, last Wednesday, because I did come to the sign meeting. But prior to that, um, we received the letters in the mail. We had no idea that any meetings had gone on prior to that first. Okay, I thought meeting. I thought I heard that you were, you were intending to meet with the abutters anyway. So I think yes, that might be a good idea before the next before the next meeting as well to meet with them all too. To go over any concerns, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Could, could I just ask? Oh, sure. And, uh, I uh, I pose this with no idea as to whether it even makes sense, but um, I, I hear you mention your concern about the tanks being close to the property line. Mm -hmm. Would you be more comfortable if the tanks were in the front of their property and the um, pumps further back? And again, I I don't know what impact that has, but if any, but uh, which I guess would you prefer, the, the pumps being closer or the tanks? Um, or do you, have you thought about that? I haven't thought about that. I, the concern with the tanks is leaks. What I mean, I know that there are things that I just, I don't know the unknown, I guess. And with it being 
extremely close to the corner of my house, that's, that's probably one of my concerns. The gas pumps could be further into their property than closer to the edge of mine, um, which would then in turn be closer to my, you know, not as close to my house. So I'm not really sure what I would prefer. Um, I just, that it's the gas itself is a concern for me just because if something happens, how does that affect my property? You know, I, I, I don't know if I should disclose. I worked for Cumberland Farms some 30 years ago, so uh, as oh. an area supervisor, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mention it not so much to disclose, but I'm, you know, I'm fairly familiar with the operations. Uh, Cumberland Farms is a different company then than it is now in terms yep. of type of store and the like, but for purposes of uh, ease of mind, tanks themselves are extremely safe. As was mentioned, they're fiberglass, they're double walled. As soon as anything <coughs> leaks in that airspace between the inner tank, the outer tank, an alarm goes off. The, the, the potential, and I'm not suggesting it, it, it's, it's a high potential, but there's more of a potential with the tanker truck than the tanks themselves. Because once those tanks are there, uh, they're, they're con constantly, continuously monitored. They're yeah. about as safe as, 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 as can be. Uh, considered for a you know, volatile fuel. How long ago did you work? Thirty years. <laughs> I'd like to say three years ago, but it was about thirty. Yes, there were cars in those days. <laughs> they used gas. <laughs> <laughs> so th those are just my concerns. As the butter is the water flow off, because I do know that my neighbor which she may get up and speak, I'm not sure, who abuts my property line over there, they already have a water problem with, um, in their basement, which would be exactly where that would be draining out. So. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sharon Rayfuse, 14 Seminary Way. Um, I actually live next door to Sue on this side, um, but there's a buffer of land between her property and my property, but it's all woods. Um, and I just, same thing, I just want to just reiterate, I'm really concerned about thoughts of an easement and water draining into these woods here. Um, we do have a sump pump that runs, and Sue's house is built fairly high off the ground. The house next to her on the other side, that pump runs 24-7. It's running all day long, every day. So there, there's water under there. Um, constant drainage into that, um, going down every 72 hours. Eventually, I would think that the water tables would just keep rising and rising. I don't know how it keeps up. Um, our whole street down the end is flooded. I mean, there's a lot of water. So that's just, that's my concern. And then I wasn't really sure why the fence wasn't running all the way across the end of this. Why is it stopping? I think it should go all the way um, and it definitely needs to be higher than six feet. Um, but those are my main concerns. Oh, in addition to the why is it open for 24 hours, but, um, in, you know, if that's what they're aiming for, then that's not my decision to make. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can come on up. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to... Um, Confirm with the board that we certainly will meet with the two abutters to, um, we have four weeks. Um, I think their, their concerns can certainly be addressed. I do want to inform the board, um, as the peer review consultant stated, that the soil is actually better than what we assumed in our um, data, because we assumed CD, which is what it was mapped. And when we actually switch that over to a, if we go to a C soil, that's going to demonstrate that that water will actually infiltrate more than what it is. As we design this right now, it, there is no overflow after a two-year storm. At a 10-year at a storm, the water that comes out of there is 0.2, which is like a fourth of an inch of water that will be overflowing from there. And then for a 100-year storm, two inches of water actually overfills there. So I, I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to design this to um, for 100 year storm, so that way there'll be no water that discharges outside that after we, we work those calculations. I just did want to let the board that the, the, the runoff rate that we had was significantly less than the water that is going there now, um, and that's with the conservative calculation. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. Yep. I think 
both the abutters mentioned, but is there um, a design reason why the fence doesn't extend all the way? I don't know. That's a good one. I think the line may got cut off. But, <laughs> but no, that, that fence would certainly uh, recommend go all the way to the end of the property line. And I think it'll be a good, we'll, we'll meet, but um, it's something whether that fence goes up, up higher or I think we can get some natural plantings on the other side, which I think is a little bit better because it, it, it protects the sound as well. Um, and I'm sure they'll like that compared to the traffic going going by the site. So sure we can work something out. Right. Thank you. Well, did you want to go through your questions too? Or? No, oh, I think that you've gone through all the extensive extent of them. Off. Steve, I think we have another butter. Oh, we do? Oh, absolutely. Come on up, please. I am not in the bottom. Can I have a question as well? Sure. Just uh, I'm, I'm Peg Dooley, and I'm at 9 West Main Street. Um, who owns the property currently? Was it Dave Cohen? Pardon me? Mr. Cohen, Cohen did own it. Was it David Cohen? I believe it is. Does Cumberland Farms own it? Unless they bought it from Mr. No. I don't believe they do yet. The owner is Are all of these approved? The owner has submitted a letter um, authorizing Cumberland Farms to submit for this property for so, all of these applications. So all of these approvals are contingent upon them purchasing it? Uh, however they work that out with the owner is... Yeah. No, it's going to be a ground lease. Yeah. So It's what? Going to be a ground lease. What does that mean? They would lease the land from the owner, who would retain ownership of the land, but they would... And all the property on top of it would be theirs. For how many years is that usually? Ground lease is usually 99 years. It can be, but you know, we yeah. you know, prefer not to disclose the terms of the lease. But isn't that significant to the abutters and the rest of the town as to how this will be run and for how long? <clears throat> I don't think so. I think that if the approval is to operate a, a retail convenience store with automobile filling stations, and then if that use changes, whoever um, is going to operate something different is going to have to come back in front of whatever board has jurisdiction. So I don't know. It, it's not like it's a carte blanche that you know, into forever that it's going to be this use. If somebody wants to change it, they can. Like this was a, a Bank of America beforehand. Mm -hmm. Also, um, what formula or standards does such as Cumberland Farm use to determine where they want to put stations? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, should I be addressing you? That's fine. Yeah, I just don't yes, but that's, that's okay. Um, I mean, they, they take a lot of different uh, items into consideration. First, you need a willing either seller or lessor. I mean, that's the first thing. Um, and they have to, a lot of it is driven by economics, traffic data, et cetera. I can tell you that we go through a, a bunch of different sites. We being I'm typically a permitting attorney for Carmel Farms, we go through a bunch of different sites. and. Some make the cut and some don't. This is one that they thought was viable for a host of reasons. We came, met with the town, uh, got some good feedback, and then proceeded to go through the design and development process. So it's not like a one-size-fit-all. There's not a, an answer to that question. It's, there's a, a lot of different factors that factor into it. Because there's already a gas station of I don't know how many pumps Speedway has right down the street. And uh, as has been mentioned before, there is another Cumberland farm in town. And I don't know why Mr. Siegel is going to Mansfield for gas when there's plenty of gas right in the center. <laughs> I do appreciate him patronizing Cumberland Farm. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of where the location is. Right. But he probably passes one to get there. One living on the other side of 495 makes it. Makes, that's the difference. Yes. Um, I realized that there was a zoning board meeting apparently last week having to do with signage. Is that something that um, has been determined already or is in the process or what? Yeah, so we received approval last week um, for some what I would consider relatively minor variances from the sign bylaw here in town. Um, I think what your bylaw allows is a 10 foot high sign. We, we asked for, I think, a 14.7 foot sign. That was granted. Um, and also some, um, we've got a few more wall signs. There's a sign on the canopy here and here, and then a building sign here and here. Um, and then it was determined that, if you're familiar with Carmel Farms, they have a smart pay and a non-smart pay 
program. So what this, and I don't know if you have it, you can probably find it on one of the plans, but um, there is, uh, there's no electronic message board. So I think Mansfield may have it where they can show the price of milk or uh, slushies or whatever they're offering. That This sign uh, does not have that. This is just gas price and diesel price. But the gas price will change every 10 seconds from the smart pay member let's say smart pay member uh, dollar and then non smart pay member and it'll be a dollar ten and so that's the change so that's what we needed zoning board of appeals approval for and we received unanimous approval last week okay, can I just speak to that notwithstanding what the ZBA did and I just want to be up front with you I, I cannot personally approve a special permit with a 14 foot sign in that area and again um, I, I want to see you there um, I think it's a, a great site for you, um, but by the same token, it's, it's in an area of town that we're looking to enhance. You just built a, a store at Hart's Corner in, in Mansfield, in, uh, excuse me, Taunton. I don't know what the dimension of that sign is, but it's probably no more than 10. It might even be lower than that. Uh, given the curvature of, of the street, a 10-foot sign can be seen from, from Speedway, if, whatever they're calling themselves today. Um, you also have a 60 by 40 foot canopy that um, is in essence a sign for Cumberland Farms. And again, I don't quarrel with that, but I think a 14 foot sign is completely counter to the, the look we're trying to uh, engender. And by going with a more conventional size sign in that area, I don't see you being uh, hampered whatsoever. I do, I, and the, the heart corner sign does have the the smart pay price and the, um, I'd love to know what the dimensions are but I'm just telling you as a member notwithstanding what the ZBA granted for a variance I can't vote for a special permit with a 14 foot sign um, that's just me um, a special permit for the gas station for the gas station itself if it's going to carry a, four, a 14 foot sign and it's uh, interesting you know the zoning board actually thought about having us go higher Again, they, they just to <coughs> preserve the sight lines underneath to make sure that it, there was you know, adequate sight lines, but because of the distance from the roadway, especially the traveled way, they felt comfortable keeping it in. You're, you're wide open there. I mean, I, I grew up in that area, so I, I know the, the area extremely well. Um, and the line of sight coming, going um, eastbound on West Main Street, you could have a three foot sign, you're going to see it. Um, but just so you know, I, I don't want you to you know go down the the path of permitting only to find out that at least this member won't vote for 14 foot sign. Thank you. Thank you. And also along that line, this property is about five or six properties from the historic district, and um, as much as it does not extend to 60 West Main, um, it is part of the village commercial, which we're trying to revamp and have another picture of. Um, it would be nice if everything was on the conservative side, be it lights or signage. In the beginning of the presentation, it was suggested a vinyl fence and then stockade was mentioned. Which is it? So I think we've got, I mean, I think we proposed the six foot high white vinyl, vinyl fence. fence. Which is what is on your other locations and it kind of just jumps right out at you. I mean, so zoning's all about alternatives, too, and you have to look at what's existing there now. And I think you've got a company that's coming to, to make a significant investment in the town of Norton, um, both to increase the tax base and to really revitalize a piece of this village center. I mean, you may not love every bit of it, but I think this is a conservative site. I mean, if you look at some of the other the Cumberland Farms, they would love to have a 25-foot high 125 square foot sign oh, I'm sure. look for how far you can see it even if the I mean but that's not what they did they really tried to take into account its location I mean you look at the CVS sign that's not so far away and you look how tall and, and big that is and this isn't even gonna sniff that. and that was another time in another place understood but I think you know when you look at this as a whole you're really gonna see a very yeah. tastefully done uh, conservative project just as the suggestion was of a buffer um, with evergreens on the a butter side of the fence, the same should be done on West Main Street side of the fence to cover up as much perhaps of that fence and create more of a sound barrier as well. A couple of other things. Again, it was suggested, why so many pumps? Is that really necessary? And is 24 hours necessary? Just because you want it doesn't mean it's a good thing. 
I'd suggest that both are needed um, for project viability. I don't doubt that you would, but there's well, all we, kinds well, we, of other <coughs> considerations. Well, what we can do now, I think, I think you, you can sit down. I think what we should do is, is get through your, we can get through your comments if you have any further questions, and then we'll have them come up after. And, Those are the comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Come on. Just restate your name and, and address again, please. My name is Sue Lieber, 16 Seminary Way. Um, the land lease, if you were to leave the property, who is responsible for the cleanup of the gas and all of that, if you were to leave the land lease? Yeah, Cumberland Farms would be. So they would, you would be responsible for taking everything out? Yeah. It would cost the town of Norton nothing? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further comments or questions from from anybody in the, in the audience? Um, how about from the board? Uh, the, the only thing I had to ask, and I don't want to make a major issue out, out of it, and hopefully it's not, but um, I suppose I could do it because I go by often enough, but if uh, you could take and, and provide uh, the photos or dimensions of the, the sign at uh, Hart's Corner um, and run through your mind whether that works for you or not. Yes, I, so, well, I mean, we'll take a look. We'll, we'll look to catalog some of the surrounding stores just to give you a sense of what we've done. Um, and, and then we can have a discussion about it. Okay, um, everyone's indicated that they want at least four weeks then our next meeting. Um, our next meeting is on June 18th and that's only two weeks away. So the, after that we have July July 16th, which is that's six sufficient weeks time. away. I mean, yeah, okay. That's plenty. So I guess we'd be looking to continue this till the 16th. So uh, if, if there's a motion. So, so, that. so, so moved. Okay, we have a motion. second. And a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We had on the agenda to. Everyone, the meeting is still going on. We had on the agenda to go through the planning board handbook, section one revisions. Um, after the meeting last time, uh, we, we came to the idea of uh, possibly putting together a, a committee to go through this from the board. So I don't know if everyone's ready to start going through section one or if you prefer to, to break off and, and have a committee look through the entire handbook. Um, I, what are folks' thoughts on that? What would the co uh, committee entail? Uh, whoever, it would be a volunteer, I mean. But going through it, what do you mean in terms of just? To, we, we need to update the handbook. Recommendations for changes? Yes. Okay. I think it would be more, more efficient and probably a better um, outcome. Um, rather than taking up air time to break out with a special uh, committee to look at it. Exactly. People with historical knowledge, perhaps. I don't know if, you know, if Joe is interested in volunteering or whoever else, but. Oh, here comes Norm. <laughs> I just had a note that the sound wasn't coming through. Oh, oh no. Oh. Yeah, just because going through it line by line in a meeting could take hours and hours and hours. Yeah, in the upcoming meetings, we're not going to have as much time, so I, yeah. I, I thought it would be a lot. A lot easier to, to have a committee put together. Um, is anyone interested in volunteering for that committee? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> One no. <laughs> I'd be happy to work with somebody else to try it to be. Yeah, just in the interest of, of efficiency. And is there a target number you'd well, like to get? Actually, like it's it's seven? I think no. two or three, no, uh, well, three likely. I, would be I don't want to put Joe on the spot, but you know, you, you're the historian here, and have, may have a better sense than anybody else as to how some of these came to be and whether or not they're relevant. Um, 
if, if uh, history is is my my primary uh, uh, contribution, <laughs> uh, there's more to it than that. I can, I can tell you that in the time I've been on, we've never discussed the operation. Uh, the uh, and you can see I'm looking at uh, who signed it, Joe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of stuff in the handbook that calls out specific. I believe years. all but one yeah. of these people are dead. Oh wow! Be candid. Oh, um, no, that's so. That's that's <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, I'm still alive. So that um, means that it's, it's uh, long before me. Um, the the one question I had, and I don't know if you had a chance to ask town council. My concern yeah. is that we place too much faith in this, and it runs counter to. Uh, in other words, how much legal weight? Uh, yep. Does this have because I don't want to go through it and then have people think it's the Bible, right? And uh, we've had that issue come up a couple times. Her response was, "It, it doesn't have the legal weight. Okay. You 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 follow the state, you know, the state rules, our bylaws. This is a guidebook." Yep. Okay. That's good. And as I was looking through this, it, it struck me as a very redundant document that. This could probably, you know, it's very redundant because these things are large. Many of this, many of the pages here are covered in Subdivision Control Act, subdivision regulations, and you just look at that. Look at those, and then I there's. I think the idea was to break it down to uh, more of a, a crib sheet, if you will, or a, you know, Cliff idiot's guide right, to, exactly. to Norton bylaws. Um, yeah. There are some things in here that I don't think are covered in other documents I mean this could be a another uh, maybe in addition to that would be the here are things like procedural things that you're that the board does that could be something to add on here but um, you know it could it could really condense this quite a bit and you know we did recently add a lot of resources um, in Dropbox uh, dealing with all sorts of things, dealing with the Subdivision Control Act, through a lot of documents that the Citizen Planner Training Collaborative per has provided for planning boards. And, uh, they, you know, those have been, uh, for, you know, used for years. So, you know, those are excellent resources. Well, things that are referenced by way of an open meeting laws, um, those things we can reference by sec. I think they, they are redundant. But I think this this and the, uh, the rules and regulations for subdivision is something different. That that is a, those are rules and regulations. I think that has to get voted on by the town and approved. So those might be different than this. This is a handbook, and this probably would govern more things like you know when we want people to submit them. We want, like we we talked about trying to get them submitted a week before. But, you know those types of things operationally that we're comfortable with and, and what we're looking to to make so people understand how we want to operate. And I don't know that it does it now, but perhaps that's what I see this handbook is doing, giving them a, you know, like a, go to see Paul first. And if Paul, then, then that, you know, the process is see the director. The director will indicate X and give them a, a guide, a guidepost as to what they have to do. Uh, and and it, you know, it can be changed. We can make it very open, but that's how they started off as opposed to coming there and say, what do I do next? So I would, I would also add to that. I, I completely agree with that. But in addition to any new board members, I think it, it's, it, in my mind, would be a great resource for a new board member um, mm -hmm. if it's up to date and uh, again not redundant. Yeah. Um, so less of a line by line edit and more of a what this sh what should this be? And it might, <coughs> like Paul said, we may f find to it's best just to strike a lot of this. You yeah. know, maybe strike oh, a yeah. third of the content that is redundant that doesn't help aid in, in what you just mentioned. And yeah. Or well, you can reference the statutes and say we're governed by everybody. We have the statutes instead of trying to rewrite them. Mm. Yeah. Just yeah, say so you know, I think that's very smart. We're governed by the open yeah. absolutely open and then rules. Should that at any point in time change? It's referenced. Right. Instead and of it us changes reiterating with, it and then you know yeah then realize they changed the law exactly and, we and then we're like oh no it's not right, right. Yeah. yeah. So I think you know referencing those type of things would be a very smart idea too. So I guess the idea is then what do you want it to be and how often will it be used, right? So is it an operating policy that is also a summation of different regulations that are required and adopted by the town that maybe hold more weight? You know, that's probably oh. something that would be more beneficial to say, you know, these are the regulations, here's kind of the conceptual summary of each. Well, and then this is our operating policy. It's not a requirement, but just a guideline. Well, I think it helps somebody coming to come to the town saying, I want to uh, come to the farm. They'll come to this town for the first time. You know, how do I have to have to operate? And they've been referencing that we do operate under the open 
open meeting law. And, and that should be here so they know it. You know, that we can't do, you know, the executive sessions are governed by this law, so they know it. Uh, but beyond that, how we operationally will work and what, you know, what we, the expectation is. We don't have to be bind by it, but this is how we propose, you know, it should be working this way. And this is the way we, we'd expect them to proceed, to help them and to help us. And I don't know what, I don't know what it does now. I, didn't, I, I just went through section one because that's what we were doing. I know, I know. <laughs> I apologize. And I'm going to have notes on that one to last year. There's a lot and, in the back half. And, 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 and since we're not, uh, we're not elected for five year terms, I, I, I had to stop. Well, I know. You know, you know <laughs> it's the first paragraph, right, Dorn? You're like, okay. <laughs> town meeting in five year terms. Yeah. No, no, no. Maybe we're in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> Again, with, with limiting the impact of going line by line with all of us yeah. at, at an open meeting like this, just. Uh, it would save so much time if there was a, if there was a committee put together to discuss this offline and then bring their findings to to the entire board um, and go through more like the meat and potatoes of it and so that that was my thinking on it. Yeah, I agree. And it, have Paul actively be part of that committee and you know have a time limit as well. You know if if the subcommittee meets you know however often you know limit it to whatever an hour two hours so. Doesn't take up too much time, or you know, everybody's time. Whoever <laughs> volunteers for it, I didn't hurt anyone volunteers. I'll, I'll volunteer. volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be. A, I don't want to be a committee of one. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll volunteer. So what we'll do also is, I, I, I mean, unless there's objection, we'll we'll add it to a lighter day. Um, the committee's uh, comments or conclusions, anything, um, or just a. Just a report. Well, actually, just so it's not on, you know. So what might be happy, ha helpful is if everybody had, you know, just when they get a chance, start to go through and just send out some notes of areas they think are, need to be worked on, just so we're not acting in the blind. So you, you, you're somewhat familiar with what's in there, and you see issues that are problematic that you don't think work, or that you want to make some suggestions. If you can get them to Paul, then we can all go through them and we'll try to make them into some highlighted version that we all can talk about. We have two volunteers going once. Do we have a third? Uh, I think just to, to uh, we ought to have three just to uh, have a mediator between Orrin and I. <laughs> nothing else. So you two are both uh, local. Well, I'm not going to say retired. I guess we have to be local yeah, to be on the board. I mean, you're, you're, like, you, don't, <laughs> you don't work outside of Norton. No. You're retired. Yeah, I know you're retired. And anyone else in that situation where they're around during the day? In town. I'm a, I'm around during the day. My office is right out of town, but I, I, I don't want to. I'm not sure if I'll have the time to do it, so yeah. I, I don't, wouldn't want to commit immediately. But so I'll volunteer because I work from home and I, I get a little more flexibility. I don't run my own business. <laughs> Brave soul. There you go. I'm jealous, Kevin. I'd like to work from home. <laughs> <laughs> I own my own business and I don't work from home. I mean, I'd, I'd uh, like to I'd take that myself. Right now. Yeah. Like home. Yeah. All right. Excellent. I like so to think like I did that penance by. Putting all this in that editable word format. <laughs> <laughs> that's my. Uh, you that's have? right. You it did is? do that. That's a tip. Yeah. 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 A couple years scanned, back. I scanned it in through OneNote and OneNote OCR a little bit of it. And I mean, so it, sections in here. I, saw. <laughs> can I just pass. I did what I could. Can I just pass this around? This is what I have as the plan that shows the different zones. And maybe you guys are better off, better identifying the streets than I am as to where that would fall. And I didn't look at it, but the new digitized map does it have the water That's resource the protection school, district on it? Yes. Oh. Through zone two. Through zone two. Zone three isn't on there? But who knows how accurate that that's, map is. Too. Well, I, well that's, we can, confer, that's we can get that confirmed. To virus, so I don't know what that is. <laughs> so let's, let's stick to the topic here. So we have the, the committee will be uh, Oren um, and Joe okay. and, and Kevin. 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 Yep. Okay. And I can, um, we're, we're right now in the process of of purchasing uh, a professional version of Dropbox for a number of reasons, but they, according to their information now, if we put a document up there, you can work on it jointly. Oh, it's like SharePoint. Or better, oh, Google, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so, yeah. So do, it, we have to, we, do, do we have to have a Dropbox version, a certain version on our, because I have limited capacity. I have a Dropbox, but it has limited capacity to hold anything. So I can just work yeah. off of your Dropbox. Right. Time. So well, I think what we would what we would do there is we would host it because now it'll be a professional, you know. So it has a quite. A, it's into tetra, tetrabytes. Never heard of it, but it's that's huge. It's, it's gigabytes yeah, to the you know. Um, 
Um, it's beyond. It's the next step above gigabytes. So, oh, okay. so um, one of the reasons we want to do that is where we have documents that instead of you all just taking it and editing it separately, these you can now work on them on a document at the same time on the same document. So you could see each other's edits as they're happening. It's really convenient. How, how's, yeah. How does that work? Well, <laughs> it just you, tracks you. Yeah, just, yeah, just when you do it. Yeah. yeah. So it, you'd open different it up color? And, yeah, be like. A different you, color. Yeah, you'd yeah. open it up in Dropbox, Orin, and, and click the edit tool, so, you know, and it would almost just automatically track your changes. And then if Joe were to go in, you could see, oh, look, all of Orin's comments are in ORS or AOS or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, we used, uh, years ago, I used. Uh, Google Drive that way for a document yeah. we were working on in Austin and at one point I think we had 20 people working on it at the same time. That's not a great situation just because you could be typing and someone else now bumped the page down but hopefully we won't have that. So, so until that's set up I think yeah. if anyone else who's not on the committee has, has um, suggestions or edits maybe go through Paul and Paul will send them out as a list so that you're not getting bombarded with a hundred different emails. Mm. Um, yeah. That's my yeah. suggestion. So. It's really fun if you're editing it at the same time as somebody else and you write little notes to them. Oh, Hi, yeah. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there any other? the Dropbox account for that co-edit must be set up through the Norton Mass website uh, email address. Will you have one of those? I do. I have All one. All set up? Yeah, I, I know a few of you do not. I've taken right. the notes, and we'll, we're going to get it fixed. So for now, for those of you not getting <laughs> emails, we'll also use your private until we get that all fixed or you guys get it all fixed. Yeah, I didn't even know we had a meeting tonight. I didn't get the email. <laughs> you did? No, I didn't. So in the box. They, they, they I didn't get the box. To the 16th, do we have a meeting? In the, in, is there still a scheduled meeting? Before? We have a scheduled meeting f for the... Is, that's when we're doing the open meetings? Oh, that's right. Right, aren't we coming early so we can do the, the 18th. open meeting Yeah, the 18th training, is when we right? have a meeting. We that's the, the two weeks. One? There's an open meeting the 18th. Oh, right. The no email uh, category, so oh, I didn't okay. know that... All right. It's with other boards as well. It's it's no, the open yeah, meetings us. training that Amy will provide. It'll be six o'clock on uh, the eighteenth. The eighteenth. June eighteenth. And that's us in zoning, right, Paul? Yes. Okay. Then yeah. we have a meeting Monday. after that, though. This and then you go to your seven. Then you'll have your seven fifteen meeting. So it'll be right here. It's but right now. There's nothing on that meeting yet. Nothing. No, um, there isn't. But there are a couple things I guess we should discuss. One of which is. Um, we uh, we are finishing up on the the uh, the report for the Norton Village Center. Peg mentioned it earlier. It's coming, and the consultants available to present it to to us on the 18th. Um, in addition, I received an email from our, from Town Council, you know, who will be here doing the training. Would like to do an executive session to talk about. I guess it's it's going to be about. Uh, about Fairland Farms, I would mm -hmm. I would assume that's what yeah. it's what it's for. So we'll have to make sure that the the previous members. Are is, also is there any material that they need need from us, or they'd like to see from us in advance of that meeting? Any comments that we would have? No, but there's one. Well, uh, I haven't heard that, but I just received uh, a letter or a report from council. A response document. Um, I don't know that you all received it, but we will scan it and get it out to you all. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. The open meeting training is that being held here? Here. Yeah. Okay. Is the open meeting training an open meeting, or is that a closed meeting? Uh, we'll we'll post it as an open. Uh, yeah, I no. I, but it'll be open. Okay. So then, on the 18th, our meeting will have both an open session and then a executive an executive. Session. Mm -hmm. If there's no other business. Uh, Motion to approve, uh, adjourn, <laughs> approve an adjournment. <laughs> I approve. Second. Motion and second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.